Hello everyone, welcome back. Today we'll be looking at colonial women. Last week we focused on colonial women in the West Coast, particularly focusing on Native American women. This week we're looking at the East Coast, so these are mostly Anglo-American or European-American women. And what we're going to see is how, um, not that things were any better for, for women in this period, but um, we do find that they did have certain opportunities that begin to be limited once we become a nation. So for about um, a little bit over 150 years, women did have certain avenues where they had a, a sense of worth in the colonial period. But once we become a nation with very kind of strict laws, um, women opportunities begin to diminish. So you had two articles that kind of highlight some of those opportunities. And, as we mentioned um, last week with the concept of agency, it's, it's never perfect. It's not like in the 1600s, your American women just could do whatever they want. And then those restrictions were put once we became a nation. It's, it's not like that. Um, but again, these things are very relative. So we're going to look at a few examples uh, in this lecture that covers, again, a, lar a large span of time. So one of the biggest issues that we have, as we talked about um, last week, is this concept of, of what's valid history, correct? So uh, typically we uh, associate history with, with men, right? That they're the ones who are um, building communities in the sense of laws and, and, you know, kind of pushing people out of territory so they can take over that, that land. And when it comes to women's history, we find that they actually play a very intricate role in developing the Americas. So this question of who built America is a very important one and how it was built. Most of us have the perception that it was some pilgrims that crossed the Atlantic or something like that and you know, kind of good Puritans built the United States. Well, um, that did happen, but that's not the, the rule. You know, those are more exceptions, right? <laughs> However, as you know, we take uh, history courses in the K-12 program, we we don't want to look at the bad stuff, so we focus on these kind of nicer stories. And, and again, that Pilgrim story or uh, that Puritan story is one of the better ones. So here we're going to kind of challenge that a little. It's not intentional, but it's just reality is that not everybody that came to America were, you know, people who were fleeing Europe because of religious persecution. <clears throat> Sorry that I laughed, but it's just hilarious. <clears throat> so we find that um, uh, women... Um, that come to the United States, again, things are not great. They, they are viewed as second-class citizens. Um, but we find that that myth that they were coming to America because they were being repressed of, you know, due to their religious beliefs in, in England, um, were coming to the United States to make a fresh start is, is, is kind of weak argument. You know, it, it couldn't be further from the truth. And we're going to see how um, a good majority of women came for different reasons. Another kind of key point, uh, going back to the initial question as to who built America, right? We find that women played a very intricate role in building community. So yes, maybe men were out there conquering territory, but it's the women who were integral um, in, in developing the concept of nationhood, uh, at least community, maybe not nationhood quite yet. So uh, one kind of very <clears throat> simple example is that, you know, most Women are the ones who maintain um, the faith in the family. That happens today as much as it did in history. So they're very important to the community. And also they're the ones who kind of help the, the community survive. They're the ones who are building networks uh, in the community uh, because they're the ones who are supporting the family unit more than men are. So yes, men are important, uh, but women are just as important in this particular period. And lastly, we're going to see how land plays a very important role. We find that women, uh, sorry, men were actually offered land uh, if they were associated with a woman, right? If they were married. So um, there's an incentive there for um, women to come in large numbers uh, because uh, you as a man can actually benefit from this. So just to give you an example, uh, the Lord of, uh, Bartim of Baltimore in Maryland offered 100 acres for anybody that came to what is now the United States, um, particularly as, you know, as a married couple, so they can settle a community. 
right? This is a major contrast to what was, you know, what we read last week with Native American people, right? Most of those were just kind of single men who were in, the, in that kind of um, California region who um, were kind of taking those Native American women. I mean, that's a nice way to say it, right? That they were taking these Native American women and, uh, you know, they're trying to encourage to settle them. And there in, in the West Coast, you see more uh, inter, what we would call interracial mixing, whereas in the East Coast, you know, they were coming more as some, not all, but, you know, some of them were coming as families and you don't have that kind of mixing happening as much uh, in the East Coast as you do in the West. So were these women looking for freedom? Well, uh, you know, again, that's, that's not really what took place. Um, many of the people that came to the Americas kind of follows the same narrative as what happened in Australia, right? Today we have the stereotype that people from Australia are, are descend from criminals. And yet in the United States, we don't, we don't share that same idea, right? Because we don't want to think of ourselves as descending from criminals, I guess. But we find that just like in Australia and different parts of you know, the British colonies, uh, people were coming for the, for the same very, you know, uh, same reasons, right? Many of them were convicts and they were given the option whether to serve time in you know, different prisons that they were uh, located at in England or they can risk their life and come to places like Australia or places like the United States. So we find that uh, many uh, prisoners, if you will, or you know, people who, who face jail time opted to come to the United States rather than serve time. In their native land and and uh, you know um, many of them tend to be prostitutes uh, here's a fiction uh, fictitious book called Ma Flanders but it's kind of based on reality of how women who uh, came in numbers uh, because they were prostitutes and were convicted in Europe and they came to America where they'd rather be free and serve their time and, and, and you know these are hard times you, know, you come to America during this period the early 1600s um, you know, the 17th century, and there's a possibility that you can die. So it, it's, it's a bit of a toss up to see which one's better. Serve your time in Europe or come to America. And I like to say 50 50 chance of dying, but it's actually much worse, right? So, um, it, it was a bit of a risk, but again, that's, that's who we are as a nation, right? Uh, these are just some examples, right, of prostitutes, but, you know, others committed other sorts of crimes and given the same option. <clears throat> a lot of times what you have too is that some of these women that came, so you have the prostitutes, right? You have the convicts, but some of these women that came were also um, kind, of, um, kind of like modern day mail order brides, if you will. So we see places like in the Carolinas advertise for women to come over there in Europe, right? They're advertising in Europe to get women to come to the United States. And kind of for the same reason that I mentioned earlier that is that many of these communities advocated for for uh, families to settle in these territories. Remember, they're taking lands from other people, from Native American people, but they want the, the land settled. So they're actually um, asking them to come to the um, different parts of the United States and, and settle these territories. So here's just uh, another example in, in 1619, quite early on, you know, they, they bring over 144 women, uh, which is a good chunk. Um, and, and, you know, they sold for them to come over here, but we find that many of them ended up dying, you know, um, only 34 survived. So again, yes, you can serve your time over there or you can risk coming to the United States. There's a possibility that you might die. Um, and men too, right? Not just women, but men too. But again, this is a great example of how they were selling women. Um, I guess it's um, what we would call today maybe something like white slavery. I guess male order brighter is a better example uh, because that's essentially what they were, right? Bringing women from Europe and they would marry anybody basically and, um, and settle in, in different parts of the colony. So, you know, this is who we descend from, right? Uh, which is... Again, we, we want to think that we're all, you know, our ancestors, or maybe some of us can trace our lineage to, to the Mayflower or something like that. No, more than likely, you know, great, 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 great grandma was some prostitute or some criminal or something like that, right? Um, you know, you probably don't want to trace that family tree too, too deep sometimes. <clears throat> 
um, you know, when women came, these women uh, are described in different ways. Um, William Byrd describes these women as rugged. Uh, so this kind of challenges the perception that these women were housewives and you know, just stayed in the home. Many of them had the ability to go into public space. And, and this is quite important because that ability to go into public, public space begins to diminish as, you know, we get closer to 17, you know, late 1700s into the 1800s. So they're hunting, you know, they're, they're providing, right? <clears throat> there was a division of labor. We're not going to negate that. You know, it's not like women were doing men's jobs. At times they did, as a reading kind of highlight that. Um, but again, they're very important to the survival of the community. So they did these type of jobs, right? Yes, knitting, quilting, um, making brooms, making candles, things associated maybe with certain gender um, stereotypes. However, we find that they're also chopping wood, which is you know very kind of physical labor. Um, even making candles requires some kind of skill to do. So uh, there is this uh, ability that they begin to lose as we move closer to the 1800s. They balance home budgets. Uh, maybe that still happens today. Sometimes these things are divided by gender, but um, you know they're they're the ones who are taking care of the, the bills and responsible for the household income. They're doing outside work. So yes, the husbands are responsible for the majority of the work um, when it comes to farming, but they are also uh, helping in, in, in farming. So they're helping side by side by, by their husbands. They're not just completely in the home doing work. And even then, um, out in the field, they have their own garden that they're tending to. So again, they're very important to this. The reading also kind of highlighted that some of these women um, ran different industries, right, in, in colonial America, and, and they, again, provides many great examples. A lot of times it was temporary, whether you know, sons came of age, uh, but sometimes they learned the skills too, how to be a blacksmith, a tailor, a publisher, a shoekeeper. So these are uh, opportunities that might not have happened again, much later on. You do have women who are, you know, again, this is not a uniform women identity during this period. You know, you got working class women, uh, you have more kind of, I guess, what we would call professional women. Margaret Bent, uh, she was a plantation owner. And, uh, you know, she was able to take people to court, people who wronged her. This begins to, again, diminish later on in American history. We have women who were, we wouldn't call them doctors, but if you were, if you call yourself a doctor of, of any sorts in, in this colonial period, it didn't really carry that prestige because most of these male, you know, people who did call themselves doctors, particularly males, uh, engaged in amputations, right? If you had something wrong with you, they just took the easy route out and, um, you know, just took off one of your limbs. When it came to women, uh, the best example that we have midwives, uh, they actually had a very lengthy apprenticeship and they had to help in many births before they can call themselves a midwife. So you were probably better off going to a woman um, doctor, if you will, than to a male doctor during this period. Some of them had great knowledge of herbal medicine and um, here's just an example of um, this woman who, and, and sorry for the terminology, but this comes from a source, um, but, uh, you know, who took great care of people when they were sick, right? Uh, because she had this kind of deep knowledge of medicine for this era. We find that uh, some women uh, did come, so we talked about the, you know, the ones that were being advertised in Europe coming to the United States and being married off. As we get a little bit later in American history, late 1600s, you begin to see the implementation of indenture servitude. Uh, so you do have men who are coming over, but you, you have the majority of them being women. <clears throat> and, you know, um, they're, they're basically being uh, sold over here in the States you know, they pay for their um, transportation to the to the colonies and they're being sold to somebody uh, but we have to make sure to know the difference between this and slavery these are two different you know completely different things um, so yes 
you do have somebody being sold, particularly white women who are being sold, and some men. Um, but unlike slaves, these women did have rights. Uh, for example, it was required by whoever bought them to provide these basic goods to them. So you had to feed them, you had to clothe them, and you had, and you had to provide shelter. It was a requirement. Um, for the indentured servant, um, they could not marry. If they did, it um, would add to their servitude, uh, particularly if they got pregnant. Um, the whole point is that you you know, serve a certain amount of time, which I think averaged about seven years. And so if, if you did end up getting pregnant, it would just add to your servitude. But eventually, that servitude would end. Uh, they had to work from the time the sun went up to the time the sun went down. Unlike slaves, who you could more or less work them to death if you wanted to. You could, you know, do whatever you want to them. With indentured servants, you cannot do that. And then lastly, if you felt you were wronged by your, um, I guess, owner, uh, you as an indentured, indentured uh, servant could take them to court, which is something that slaves had absolutely no opportunity to do. So again, um, slavery and indentured servitude are two major different things, all right? Um, a lot of people try to say, well, you know, this is slavery too. No, it's not. You know, this is, you know, these people were, had better opportunities and again, legal protection under the law. When it came to life, um, you know, uh, women were very important to the community. If, if maybe like today, right? If, if you're married, you pay less in taxes. Uh, we find that, um, men could take these women to court if they uh, did not marry them, you know. Um, so if, if a woman uh, was engaged to a man and then she she opted out, out of this relationship, a man could actually take her to court and she would be fine. <clears throat> we find that, um, you know, these women were very important to the community. Uh, it, was, it was about, again, building um certain towns and uh the goal is to procreate right to build community so uh, here's just a quote from somebody during the colonial period that says our land is free our men are honest and our women are fruitful so to some extent this is the perception that they had of women that you know your the main goal was to reproduce when it comes to um relationships in this era it's quite interesting what we find because um, we think of them, again, as very Puritan, right? We, we want to think of our colonial past in very positive light. And we find that uh, there's some elements of that, but, you know, kids will be kids, if you will, right? Teenagers will be teenagers. So they practice this concept called bundling, the Puritans, where basically, you know, two couples would be together in bed. And the goal was that um, they would not engage in sexual activity. So they put a board between them, uh, a bundling board. And, um, you know, sometimes it works, sometimes it didn't, right? Because uh, these people are no different from who we are today. We find that in uh, during the colonial period that, like today, right, people have sex, people, you know, get pregnant. And uh, if they did, it was not much of an issue, you know, as long as the man promised to marry her, she would maintain her respectability, if you will. And um, life would kind of go on. And, and this, again, challenges that perception. These people were good Christian, you know, holier-than-thou um, people. And, and nothing could be further from the truth. And I'll give you a, statistics, uh, a statistic in a minute to show you how much it represents who we are today. Um, <clears throat> so we find that, you know, getting pregnant was not a stigma during this period, again, partly because this is the goal, right? For women to reproduce. So not that everybody was happy about it, but if you did end up getting pregnant, um, oh well, you know, life kind of moves on. And we find that there was a study actually done that in, um, in, in a community where you, know, you have about 200 couples and, and these are people that were not married, um, you know, when they engage in, in 
in, in sexual activity uh, for the first time, we find that a third of them actually admitted to premarital sex um, during this kind of colonial period, right, between these years. And if you look at statistics today, this is about 33%, uh, in other words. And if you look at statistics today, they are actually quite the same. Today, um, students, I always like to ask this question to see what you all think about, you know, how many people are, are actively engaged in this, you know, in, in early, I guess, early sexual activity before marriage. And uh, a lot of people say like, oh, it's 50%, oh, it's 70% and so forth. Statistically speaking today, it's actually like in the 40%. So the Puritans were not that far off, right? At least in this example, as we are today, you know? Uh, our, our ancestors are just like us, in other words, right? Uh, who would have thought, right? Um, and, and, you know, they're also engaged in different things. So, uh, you know, life is hard for women during this period. So if they engage in pre, uh, or sorry, in adultery, they could be taken to court. Um, if they were found guilty, you know, there were different consequences for these actions, everything from whipping to paying a fine or to even branding, right? And this is a very patriarchal society. So these uh, actions are, are, are pertaining not just because they want to control women, but because what's at stake. Uh, if she was pregnant, she had to um, confess the name of the child or lose it, or sorry, the name of the father or, or lose the child. <clears throat> and um, when they're having these kids out of wedlock, uh, you know, whether it's, you know, in, in a case such as adultery, the real issue here is property, right? Because if you're having these kids outside of these relationships, then they could call a, a claim to your property. So these different communities are trying to limit that. Uh, so this is part of the reason why there's so much kind of control on, on women's bodies because of, of what's at stake, right? Men's property, in other words. So what do we learn? Um, I know I'm going through this kind of quick. Uh, kind of quick. I don't. I, I try to do these uh, lectures kind of uh, fairly fast, just so you can get the information and 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 rather than spend like an hour in a lecture. Um, but what do we learn? Number one, that the colonial period, women did have more freedoms than as than much later when we become a nation. They did have different opportunities that begin to be erased as we get closer to the 1800s. We find that women's identity, as we kind of highlighted here, right? You have female doctors, you have um, indentured servants who are mostly women, uh, a lot of prostitutes. Uh, you know, you have a, a collection of women, and there's really it's it's really hard to write because it's not just one story; it's multiple stories. And unfortunately, throughout history, we focus only on one, which is that Puritan Christian motherhood, if you will, and um, nothing could be further from from that truth. And we find that um, women's status during this period, uh, you know, for and for a long time, gets tied to men's identity, right? Uh, she only has values because a man can marry her and get land, right? Uh, she has value because she can reproduce, as you kind of we kind of see in that article by um, by uh, Castaneda, right? That a woman's value is in her uterus. Uh, in Western culture, unfortunately. So uh, these women's identity are, are still tied to who they're connected to, who their partners are. And during this period, it's mostly men. All right, so we'll stop it there. And uh, next time we meet, we'll talk about, um, talk about something. Uh, probably, I'm trying to think. Oh, women during the uh, American Revolution.